They regarded the body of the car as a fuselage. 60 miles an hour in 18 seconds. So it appeals to the sporting rallying driver inside all of us. The actual power the engine develops is phenomenal. You've got lashings of chrome. Very exciting car to drive. Well, the story really begins in 1919 when three totally independent motor companies, Sunbeam, Talbot and Darak, um, decided they would form a combine. Over the 1920s, um, Sunbeam in particular indulged in record braking and car racing. So they consumed an awful lot of the money of the Sunbeam, Talbot, Darak combine until by 1935 um, they were really at death's door. And William Roots, who was one of the coming men in the British motor industry at the time, and his brother Reginald, having gained control of the assets, um, they then decided that they would like to capitalise on the Sunbeam and Talbot names, which they did in 1936. They decided they would use a large number of components from the existing Humber and Hillman range to produce Sunbeam Talbot 10, 3-litre and 4-litre models. The Roots brothers wanted something new and startling for the, uh, for the post-war market, it's the Sunbeam Talbot 80 and the Sunbeam Talbot 90. They decided they would base their new designs on, on what they liked to regard as aeronautical technology because they'd been building aeroplanes in their factories in the war and there was a lot of aeronautical experience. And they regarded the body of the car as a fuselage. Um, the front wing line followed very much the lines of aircraft drop tanks and the, the general line of the car had, a, had a, um, a sweeping line from front to back. Being young and foolish, I bought one brand new in 1950. Though it was only the Talbot 80 and, and underpowered by present day standards, it was, uh, it was an enjoyable car. Uh, so when I decided to, uh, coming up to retirement, to uh, uh, have, get a car and do it up, um, I thought of uh, sunbeams with uh, some fairly fond memories. My car is uh, a Sunbeam 90 Mark III uh, coupe and it was built in 1955 and uh, the seat I'm sitting on is the passenger seat which could be taken out for picnic purposes. I, I looked for quite a time to, to find a, a, a coupe. I particularly wanted the coupe as opposed to the saloon uh, because it uh, I think the lines are nicer. Um, it also has the facility to have the open air motoring, which I like. The car, when she came out from the works, was a black car. Um, but the owner, prior to my owning it, uh, changed it to cream. The gentleman who lives here calls it the white lady. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's probably as good a name as anything. <laughs> She's uh, behaved reasonably well, has only let me down once. The, the steering is very heavy. The engine only produces 80 bhp for a, a just over a two and a quarter litre engine and the car weighs 2,700 weights, so it doesn't accelerate as well as a modern car. I believe the original figures were 60 miles an hour in 18 seconds. I mean, you very nearly walk it to that speed, but uh, once it's rolling, uh, it will go pretty fast. The instructions uh, with the car, because of the uh, slow engine speed, is that uh, you consider first gear as an emergency gear only and to start in second gear. And this is an instruction in the owner's handbook. At that time, there was a guy called Norman Garrett who'd recently been demobbed from the army. He'd worked for the Roots Group before the war as well, and he'd been very much into motorsport and competition. Um, he had the idea that if they could improve the Sunbeam breed, the Sunbeam Talbot breed, by motorsport, rallying in particular, then they would open up a whole new market for the Sunbeam Talbot motor car. He had a very difficult job because the designers and the marketing people regarded competition as something of a waste of good motor cars that could be sold for money. 
What he also tried to do was to acquire drivers with, with well-known names. And um, he enlisted the aid of one young man at the time who was becoming quite well-known in motor racing, a chap called Sterling Moss. And um, Sterling drove a Sunbeam Talbot 90 in the 1952 Alpine Rally. This is to be an Alpine conquest, and the surviving invaders press home their attack. Sterling Moss enjoys himself on the Podoi. And he astounded everybody by coming second overall. In 1953, um, Roots introduced um, a derivative of the, of the Sunbeam Talbot 90, um, called the Sunbeam Alpine. A team of six of these cars were entered for the 1953 and 54 Alpine rallies, again with teams of very well-known drivers, of which Sterling Moss was one. All set, Moss? Ah, yes, I see you are. Then, let's go. The Sunbeam Alpine had again lived up to its name, and Sterling Moss had won indeed his cup of gold. It certainly creates uh, an interest, and you get people waving and hooting. More on the continent than here. Uh, we had one very amusing incident with a, with a, a run, and uh, we went up a road in France, which uh, I suspected was closed. We got to the village, and there were barriers all across the there and the chap sort of waved his hands to say I couldn't come. I saw I got five cars behind, so he then removed all the barriers. We drove across someone's garden into a road at the back. They got out a JCB, filled in a trench which was across the road, and we then proceeded on our way with all the locals cheering and waving. <laughs> I can't see that happening here, but uh, no, it was uh, uh, <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Although the car continued in production until 1957, um, it was time, so William Roots felt, for another more modern car, cheaper to produce and with more mass market appeal. Roots launched the Sunbeam Rapier in 1955. The Rapier we have is a Series 3A. That was launched in April 61. It's different from its predecessor in having the larger 1600cc engine. I suppose I've always been hooked on classics and 60s cars. I think what attracted us to the rapier was the styling. Most of all, certainly my wife, who very much fell in love with this one. The The colour scheme, the, the chrome, mid-Atlantic styling, and American in its inspiration, very obviously with the fins and the chrome, but packaged in a size that sit, fits with uh, modern minor roads in the country. The first rapiers didn't have the fins at the back, which is the thing the car is probably most known for uh, these days. Uh, they put those on with the Series 2 in 1958, copying an update from the Studebaker styling that had inspired the car to begin with. They use lots of duotone body schemes, um, with very 1950s colours like yellow and very light grey. Lots of pastel colours like very light blue and very light grey as well. And you've got uh, lashings of chrome. The interior colour matched and that lovely veneered walnut dashboard is all part of the appeal of the car. And of course all the instruments are there so you've got full instrumentation for rallying. In the 1600cc class, the battle once again is joined between the Swedish Volvos and the Sunbeam Rapiers. There goes Paddy Hopkirk. And there goes Peter Harper. Both Sunbeam drivers are determined to beat their rivals in the class, and Harper is equally resolved to emerge yet again as highest placed British competitor. In fact, in one Monte Carlo rally entry list, uh, I think there were something like 23 Sunbeam rapiers. Um, so it was the car to use if he wanted to uh, get a good result in an international rally. Some women had great success in rallies, but were almost ashamed of it, because in their advertising, they don't want to put people off by supposing they're buying rally cars that are rather difficult to handle. So what you do is you have a little alpine scene tucked in the corner of an advert. 
you have a car speeding through an alpine pass, but it's very much a saloon car with a family in it. It isn't in any way suggesting that you have to be a rally driver. So that you get the walnut dashboards of the later cars, you get the plush seating, and this is reflected in the brochures and the advertising where colour and comfort and style are emphasised rather than speed or performance. For me as the driver, what I like about the Rapier is that it really is a, a driver's car. And all that rallying pedigree, very well set up um, in terms of handling, and suspension, and steering and so on. And with, in this model, with the 1600 engine uh, plus overdrive, um, it can keep up with modern cars and escorts and Sierras with no trouble at all. So it appeals to the sporting rallying driver that's inside all of us wanting to get out. I think we've seen over the last 10 years the classic car movement has grown and there are many more people interested now. What I like is that that's people who are buying the cars not just to keep and show very occasionally and do 10 miles a year, uh, but to use as everyday transport because they're reliable and economical. Very much part of the family and not for sale. We've done so much with it and had so much fun with it. The children are growing up with it. We could not part with it. In 1959, William Roots again decided that they needed a car for the American market. For some reason, they hadn't tried to market the Rapier um, effectively in the United States. So he decided he needed a sports car. A man's car the girls will love to drive. We believe that no other manufacturer offers so many brilliant features in a precision-built car designed for performance and economy at so moderate a price. In 1959, the Roots Group introduced a completely new Sunbeam sports car with the old Sunbeam Alpine name. It was a very pretty car, very much uh, a 19, late 1950s, 1960s sports car, um, in direct competition to such cars as the MGA and the Triumph TRs. Uh, 1967 Sunbeam Alpine Series 5, 1725ccs. The Sunbeam Alpine Sport started in 1959 and there were five series, one, two, three, four, five, and the engine steadily increased from 1494 to 1725ccs. This was the last of the, of the engine sizes. It was designed primarily by a guy called Ken Hawes, who spent a lot of his time in design studios, American design studios for cars. And I think he got lots of American ideas. He was with Studebakers for a while. And he saw the need for a sort of a fairly straightforward British sports car for the American market. And indeed, a, a large proportion of them were sold in America over the years. It was quite an expensive car for its day. It was of the order of a thousand pounds or so in the mid 1960s, which was quite a lot of money. It was above the sort of the ordinary run of the mill type car. Sort of people like me couldn't afford to buy them when we were young enough to enjoy them, I'm afraid. One day, I just happened to hear from a, um, a colleague of mine that he was selling a car. He had started restoring it, um, and he'd stripped it right down, and he had lost the garage that he was doing the work in, and he therefore had to sell it because he didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, I bought it. When I bought it, um, it was a body on four wheels with a, a very tatty hard top, very rusty, an engine in a box, and I think about 12 cardboard boxes of bits and pieces that were unmarked and unnumbered and which you really didn't have any idea what they were. I know the, the Alpine very well as a result of having had the 12 boxes of, uh, of bits and pieces and having had to decide where the bits go and exactly how they fitted as well. So. 
They started rallying with the Alpine. It was never very successful, I'm afraid. Um, some very famous drivers had a go. Peter Harper and Peter Proctor drove them. It was entered for the 1961 Le Mans 24-hour race. Um, didn't win its class or anything like that, but it did win a thing called the Index of Thermal Efficiency, whatever that is. The Alpine tried to sell itself on a mixture of jokiness and rally success, and it was generally rather poorly done. There is one advert where the car is seen full of silver cups, obviously awards when in various rallies, and the joke says, our cups runneth over. However, it's rather a difficult joke to get. There's also another one which says, the prettiest thing that ever kept a man waiting. A rather tacky byline, and certainly not trying to suggest that this was a out-and-out -out sports car with rally-bred success. I think it's a supercar to drive. Um, I find it easy. I like the gearbox. I like the clutch. It's got um, servo-assisted disc brakes on the front. It corners well. It holds the road well. I mean, not that I belt it uh, around sort of like on racetracks, but it does hold the road very well. And it's a comfortable car. It's easy to get in. I am now becoming fairly elderly, and I find I can sit in it comfortably and very well. It's got wind-up windows, which is quite an achievement for cars of that age. Um, it's got a heater. It really has pretty well all mod cons, um, and it really then is wind in the hair motoring. It's, uh, and, and I thoroughly enjoy that. It's sort of like regaining one's lost youth, I think. And even when it's raining, if you have the top down, assuming it's not raining too hard, because your windows wind up and because the windscreen is to some extent wrap around, you do stay dry until you stop, of course, and then you get wet. I think it attracts quite a lot of interest nowadays, being nearly 30 years old. Um, and particularly, I have taken it abroad on a number of occasions, and you really do get a crowd of people around if you park it in a square in France or anywhere like that. They want to know what it is, and they call it the Zoom Beam. The Sunbeam Tiger was an idea conceived by Ian Garrett. It was the Roots Group Supremo on the west coast of the United States. He decided that it would be a good idea to, to build a Sunbeam Alpine with a, a very big engine. And the engine they decided to use was the 427 cubic inch Ford V8 engine, which was quite small, quite compact, and fitted nicely into the Sunbeam Alpine engine bay. I've had the car for, well, it's 25 years. Um, I bought it in 1971 for a magnificent sum of 465 pounds. Uh, I couldn't afford the car really, so I put a deposit down, I think it was £200, and the rest was then spread over monthly payments. The car you see there I've had for virtually half of my life, so um, it's, I'm quite attached to it. So, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, I just love the car. You know, it's a favourite car of mine. I've bought and sold many cars through the years, but I would never part with that one. I've also run other Roots motor cars. My worked van is a 1962 Hillman Husky, which is used every day of the week. It stands out in all weathers, but it always starts on the button the next morning. And the underside of a Husky is very, very similar indeed to the Sunbeam Tiger. Obviously the body is totally different, but the actual chassis floor pan is the same. The Sunbeam Tiger was launched in late 1964, 1,470 pounds. E-Type at 1995, and the Sunbeam Alpine MGBs around about the 900 pound mark. It meant that the, the Sunbeam Tiger was quite expensive for what it was, and that's possibly why they didn't sell as many as Roots hoped to sell. Uh, they sold more back to America than we had over in the UK market. Um, the figures were about 7,000 built, and I think probably 
at least five, five and a half thousand went for the USA and we retain about 850 for the home market. Very exciting, very exciting car to drive. It's quite predictable as long as it's not abused. The braking system isn't bad if driven sensibly, but the, the actual power the engine develops, even in standard form, is phenomenal, I think. The most incredible thing is the amount of torque that the engine develops. You can come up to a roundabout in top gear and just go through the roundabout without even changing gear. In fact, really, once on the move, you don't really need a gearbox in the car at all. I don't use the car in the winter very much, but come the spring, when you get out of the garage and clean the thing up, and the first time you drive it, it all comes back to you like it was yesterday. And I still get a thrill out of the car now when I first drive it. It's a lovely, brutal name for a motor car. It's really brilliant, I think. It's a great name. I've owned many of those Sunbeam Tigers, but that one I've got a, a particular affection for. Yes, it's on par with the wife. <laughs> he did quite well in international rallying and looked set for um, a pretty good future in the Roots Group. Except that the fly in the ointment was that it used a Ford engine and Chrysler were taking a, a great interest in the Roots Group in the UK. Chrysler didn't like this car with a Ford engine being marketed by the Roots Group. They looked at the possibility of putting a Chrysler engine into the Tiger, but it couldn't be made to fit. So in 1967, the Tiger died very quietly. You like something with a bit of character. I can see that. How long would I have to wait for one of these? <laughs> well now, for very special customers, I could arrange almost immediate delivery. As it happened, Chrysler hadn't got long to go in the UK before they pulled out completely. The Chrysler UK Motor Company was, was renamed Talbot UK and it was taken over by Peugeot. The Sunbeam name, although the rights are owned by Peugeot, will never reappear on a British motor car. I'm a Sunbeam man through and through. I'm not quite sure why. Um, I just love the cars. I love all Sunbeams, even the Alpines and the Rapiers. Now the Sunbeam mark has gone, uh, along with all the other Hillman, Humber and Singer marks which the Roots Group had until they were taken over in the 70s. You don't have the same recognition, I think, and loyalty by people who buy cars in this country today to marks which have a good British history to them. That's what we've lost. <laughs>